What I'd like to do is take you fairly quickly through an understanding of why VUCA or disruption is really not something as bad as we think it is. So I'm going to take you through a journey. The journey is pretty basic. What is disruption in this world? Why is there disruption going on? From disruption, we're going to look a little bit at VUCA. From that, we're going to look at values. And why are values the linchpin, the key to success in getting through disruptive times? And then we're going to look at purpose. Because without purpose, without values, you're already going to be, always be stuck in the same place. And hopefully have some time for questions at the end. So, in the first part, what I want to do is, yes, there is disruptions, but it's nothing new. So I'm going to go through these slides very quickly. Anybody wants a copy of the slides, please let me know. I'll gladly send them to you. What has happened is the rate of acceleration. We have always lived in a world of disruption. We've always lived in a world of VUCA. In fact, globalization is not a new concept. Globalization started probably with Leif Erikson, continued with Marco Polo, and became popular with Christopher Columbus. In fact, globalization was something that was talked about, written about, by Adam Smith in The Wealth of Nations. So we are, especially people in HR, love creating terminology, changing things. Reality is, what we're talking about is a long-standing tradition. Now, a lot of us talk about also the fourth industrial revolution. And we talk about how it's changing. The only thing that's changing is speed, the acceleration of knowledge. So what I found is, and these are the jobs that are going to disappear. The greatest job of disappearing, the least job to disappear is chief executive officer. The job most likely to disappear are telemarketers, which is a good thing because you won't get phone calls a day. I'm going to skip that. What's causing the socioeconomic trends for disruption, according to research, is an acceleration of the changing nature of work. And yes, many people are afraid that work is going, jobs as we know them today are going to disappear. Jobs are not going to be the same. Middle class engineering countries, middle, uh, our emerging countries are a fear of change because they're taking over jobs. And there's technological changes. The cloud and big data being two of the biggest items that have caused this fear of VUCA, this fear of distraction. So I'm not going to go into VUCA because we had a speaker earlier today on it, but for those who weren't here this morning, VUCA, in case you don't know, is simply volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. VUCA has become, unfortunately, another way of saying it's a crazy world we live in. It's a world that's in constant change but it's also misleading. It's misleading because, I'm going to skip that, because if you use it as an excuse, you use it as a crutch, because the world has always faced disruptions. Globalization probably started with the first human migration. The bicycle, the horse and carriage, was disrupted by the automobile. Cruise lines were disrupted by airplanes. We've always lived in a world of disruption. The telegraph, which everybody thought was a great invention, disappeared when the telephone was invented. The telephone was threatened by VoIP. But many of the phone companies are still in business because they were able to adjust to different means of technology at different speeds. Those who see or encounter disruption 
who take advantage of it actually see it as an opportunity. The opportunity to do something different. As Bob Dylan said in his song, the times they are changing. Kodak. When I was growing up, there were TV commercials that said, this is a Kodak moment. If you go driving in the United States along certain highways, they'll say, these are Kodak moments. This is a sign of a place where you can take a great picture. But you can't buy Kodak anymore because it went out of business because it thought that nobody wanted to do digital cameras. Even though they had thought of digital cameras earlier than anybody else and rejected the idea. By rejecting the idea, what happened was, is they went out of business. Lehman Brothers went out of business. Lovano, which basically bought the IBM portable computers uh, market, they look at it differently. And they use an ancient Chinese proverb that says, a small change every year, a big change every three years. So looking at VUCA, as a disruption, looking at disruption and VUCA is merely an excuse to do nothing. Yeah, there's things happening all the time. Has speaking about VUCA been a crutch for your organization? Has thinking about disruption been a crutch for your organization? Are you not empowering the disruption to prevent you from moving forward. Now, well over 100 years ago, this gentleman, Carnegie, who if you took his wealth from when he was back then, would make Bill Gates seem like he was poor middle class, because his wealth was the largest ever recorded in history. He basically said it best. You can take away my people in my factories and grass will grow. You take away my factories but leave me my people and they'll invent new factories. They'll bring things forward. So as people involved with talent management, with human resources, you have to realize it's your people, not your products, that make the difference. It's your people that are going to move you forward. And what is going to move those people forward? As Bruce Springsteen says in the lines in his song, where the work that'll set my hands, my soul free. Where the work gives me purpose. Where I feel that I'm contributing to something significant. That is what makes a difference. When employees feel that they can contribute to purpose, VUCA disruption is nothing more than an opportunity. So how do I get through those times? Now, values, to me, are the foundation for getting through those times. Now, a lot of the organizations out here, I'm sure, how many of you have a set of values? Raise your hand if you have a set of values. Okay, now I'm going to challenge you. If I actually went and watched your people work, watch your CEOs make decisions, how many times do they make decisions consistent with the values or in violation of the values? How many people make consistent decisions? One person raised their hand. That's because you have two sets of values in your organization. You have your overt values and your covert values. The ones that are important are not your overt values. Your covert values are the ones that are important. And by the way, we talk a lot about organizational culture. Your culture are your values live. Your covert values are your culture. When an organization, and I'm going to show you an organization in a second, if they've set up the sound, that has overt and covert values together. So what are values? Values are nothing more than strongly held beliefs that are emotionally charged, resistant to change, and universally applied. I worked with a company in the Gulf region 
and we were talking about their values. And they fired an entry-level person recently that everybody felt bad about because he did nothing more than what many of the executives do every day, but they don't get fired. It caused a crisis in your organization. When leaders talk about violent values and do the opposite, they create cynicism among their employees. They demoralize the environment. You don't get anything done. I don't care what the engagement survey says. They filled out the engagement survey knowing I will not get yelled at at my boss if I score it high. So are you really getting a true engagement? Probably not. So what you need is authentic values. Authentic values are the behaviors that are lived every day by the leadership and every person in the organization. They are the unconscious actions that they take without thinking. They're the response to the customer, to a fellow employee, that happens and everybody can predict it's going to happen that way because the culture of the organization is based on a set of principles that are acted on through behaviors which are consistently understood. They are the DNA of your company culture. Now, on another topic for another day, I will tell you this. Any consultant that comes in or any executive comes in and says, we're going to change your company culture, put your resume out, because the culture will never change. Your DNA cannot change. The culture of the company can't change. because values are strongly held beliefs, emotionally charged, resistant to change, universally applied. They evolve. They do not change. And it's the values that create the company culture. They are the foundation, as somebody said earlier, one of our earlier speakers said, they are the foundation of trust. When organizations have leaders that are passionate, consistent with their behaviors, they build trust. Trust is something we unconditionally give to somebody until it's violated. By having trust, it's easy to lose. Think about this. If any of you had teenagers at home, did they ever do anything that upset you? And 20 years later, you're going to remember it. Because they violated your trust. And at that point, it takes forever to build it back. So when you take an action, there's a difference between doing something because it makes sense and doing something because you know why. Now we're going to see if they set up the sound. Hopefully they did. Purpose gives your organization direction. Purpose gives your employees meaning. Purpose gives them a reason. Purpose is for a higher calling. Purpose is something, as a human being, we all want to contribute to something bigger than ourselves. Therefore, the organization has to have purpose. It has to have a set of values that give it meaning and a purpose to give it. Now, what I want to do is show you another video clip that translates this into a business context. Well, they don't have Starbucks here. This is the founder of Starbucks. You will get the understanding of why he has made decisions that no other executive has made in corporations around the world. You're going to hear the story of his response to a shareholder at a shareholder meeting who was upset that he was giving same-sex benefits to employees. Since then, he gives tuition for four years to all employees that don't have an undergraduate degree. He gives not only benefits and tuition, he does other things to make it. As you see, the DNA goes back to the values which goes back to his life experiences, which are human dignity. So I want you to think about this. He says very clearly, the purpose of organizations is not to make a profit. The byproduct of doing business correctly is making a profit. 
When organizations have in their vision statement, by the year 2030, we will be a trillion dollar whatever, I know that that organization is set up for failure because there's no purpose for their employees. Their employees are not going to benefit from that. Their employees don't see meaning in that. In a course I teach at one of the colleges in organizational behavior, the first assignment I gave was for the students to ask the customer service representative at a local branch, what are the values of the organization? What is the purpose of the organization? How do they see those acted upon every day? 42 students came back and unanimously said, not one customer service rep at any of the seven banks they visited, seven different brands, knew the values of the organization. None of them knew how they contributed to the success of the organization. It was just the job. When they went to Starbucks, they were shocked to find out new employees, been there only two weeks, not only knew the values, not only knew the vision, but knew what they were doing to contribute to making it happen. Uh, many of them have never been to Starbucks before because the coffee is expensive and they're students. They said they felt very comfortable being there and they would rather go there than a different coffee shop even though it was more expensive because there was meaning beyond just having a cup of coffee. So what we have is an old saying. And the saying is simple. If I am not for myself, who is? And when I am for myself alone, what am I? And if not now, when? It is interesting if you interpret that saying, every person, every organization struggles every day with who they are. Every person feels that they have to have a balance between themselves and the outside world. After all, we now have customer, we now have CSR, we now have corporate social responsibility. It didn't come out of a vacuum. The bottom line is that one believes they are for themselves alone. They have no purpose. They have no direction. They have no meaning. Yet, on the other hand, if they focus too much externally, they lose their identity. Corporations are the same way. You have to create a balance between who you are and what you do to contribute. I challenge you to go ask your frontline staff when you go to work next week, ask your frontline staff what are the values of your organization. Describe the culture of your organization. Ask them the question, when have you seen an opportunity for us to live those and we didn't? When did you see an opportunity for us to live those and we did? I promise you that if your, lead, if your front line can answer those questions, you have an energized organization. You have an engaged organization. You don't have an engaged organization if you ask a question, does my boss give me the tools to do my job? Yeah, they do, but I hate my boss. Do you have a best friend at work? Who cares? It doesn't mean you give discretionary effort. That's the only question that tells you if they're engaged. Have you today done all you possibly can to be successful at meeting your objectives? You have given unwavering discretionary effort. That's the only measure of engagement. One question. As a result of that, we need purpose. Profit is not purpose. Profit adds no meaning to the contribution we make to the world beyond ourselves. Be it as disruptive times or not, is it acceptable for a company to abandon its values? Well, we're in crisis. So we have to abandon our values. I made a presentation two years ago to one of the major conglomerates here in Mumbai. 
And I actually talked about, if not now, when. Two of the CFOs said, if we didn't abandon our purpose, if we didn't abandon our original values that made us great, we wouldn't be going bankrupt today. But they lost their way in the name of profit to please the family. Because the family lost its way thinking money was more important than doing what's right. If you cannot make decisions based on your values, you can't make decisions which are consistent, predictable. And that's what employees want. They want predictability. They want to understand not only the what, but the why. The purpose of the organization. The most profound source of motivation, regardless of title, CEO, whether you're the janitor in the organization or anybody in between, is to have purpose. Without purpose, life doesn't have meaning. And as human beings, we want life to have meaning. So the net result is this. Every organization, whether they've stated them or not, has a set of values. Those values are not words. By the way, here's one just to challenge you. I'm a teacher by training. I'm a teacher by belief, not a consultant. So let me give you a teaser question. Integrity is not a value. Integrity is not a value, yet, if you look on just about every value set of every corporation, they have integrity. But think about this. Integrity generally means I do what I say I'm going to do. I'm going to keep my promise. Well, my promise is to keep these four values. And if I violate one of them, let's say trust or respect, how could I have integrity? Because I didn't keep my promise. Integrity is in reality the sum total of living my values, of keeping my promise. So every organization needs to define their values in terms of behaviors, not in terms of words. They have to have a vision that represents something significant yet to do, a purpose. From that is a strategic plan. The correctness of the strategic plan is I'm moving towards my vision while consistently living my values. As a result of that, there's consistency and predictability in the organization. Business goals and objectives by group make sense, and my individual team and individual objectives are meaningful because I give line of sight. I know that I, the individual, contribute to the greater meaning of the organization, and without my work being done, my organization is not successful. I promise you, if that is created, you will improve productivity, pride, quality, engagement, retention, and in strong, by cost of a strong employee experience. So some closing thoughts. You've got to create an attraction, selection, and retention theory. You've got to say, we will hire every employee, regardless if they are the best and the brightest, only if they fit our values. Because if they don't fit our values, nobody's going to get along with them. Productivity is going to go down. We got to, if we attract people that belong here, that feel it's a purpose, they're going to stay here for a long time. So just in closing, standing by and observing is not going to move you forward. Using VUCA or using disruption as an excuse is going to freeze you in place. Whatever you do and wherever you are, you must find the passion to achieve your vision. Passion fuels excellence and gives you positive energy. Times of VUCA and disruption demand an accurate sensitivity to the opportunities that do exist, not the excuses that we all make. 
It demands skills, the what, and exuberance of how in equal measure. It demands living your values at all times, all circumstances, no excuses. I'm going to skip that because that says pretty much the same thing. What you wind up with is values multiplied by vision, multiplied by passion, multiplied by purpose can change the world. If not now, when? So that's the presentation. Thank you very much.